nuts and nuts and nuts and nuts. Can't you hear the music playing in the city square? Send nuts and nuts and nuts and nuts. Come where all our friends will find us with the dancers there. Send nuts, send nuts, join the celebration. There'll be people there from every nation. Dawn will find us laughing in the sunlight, dancing in the city square. Send nuts, send nuts. On behalf of the Weston Historical Society, welcome to another in our series of Weston Oral Histories, which celebrate the voices of a wide range of longtime Weston residents. This time, we feature Fred Hellerman with the assistance of his wife and partner, Susan Lardner. I'm Ken Edgar, a society trustee, and I interviewed Fred and Susan in the spring of 2016, some months before Fred passed away in September of that year. Many of you may recognize the pictures in our introductory music of iconic figures of the 1950s and 60s, people with whom Weston resident Fred Hellerman, who is a major figure in folk and popular music, played or collaborated, or whom he inspired. In this interview, Fred talks about growing up in Brooklyn and his early musical, political, and social influences. He shares stories about his service in the Coast Guard, his time with the hugely influential folk group, the Weavers, his blacklisting by the House Un-American Activities Committee, headed by Joseph McCarthy, his collaborations with other artists, and how Fred and Susan came to live in Weston, as well as some related anecdotes. Let's now join Fred in his living room on Good Hill Road in Weston. Uh, Fred, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure for us to be with you today and to help you to record your oral history. So thank you for doing it. Well, you're very welcome. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let's start at the beginning, Fred. Uh, tell us about uh, where you were born and, uh, and a bit about uh, your growing up in New York City. I grew up in, in Brooklyn, uh, which was a, a wonderful uh, town. And th but this was now, by the way, was in the 1930s. Uh, I was born in 1927, and um, uh, it was a... Uh, it was a great place to, to grow up in, and uh, <clears throat> my father, my father was a, uh, came to this country from Latvia. Uh, my mother was was born in Jersey City. My father was in the uh, 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 woolen sweater business. Uh, it only had uh, there were two or three. Uh, um, Two or three uh, black women uh, that he that he had hired, and uh, and what they would do all, all day they would sit there, and they would be sorting out all the the, the fragments, all day long. Uh, they would sit and listen to uh, uh, Tommy Dorsey and Benny Goodman and Bing Crosby, and you know that was the music that they heard. And that they would be hearing all day, and in, in sometimes in the summer times when I would be working for my father, and doing you know, all kinds of things. This was the music that I was listening to also, uh, and I didn't think I mean, it was the most natural thing in the world uh, for me, you know, to, to be listening to. And, and but that's the music that I grew up with. Uh, I say that now because. There'll be other things I'm going to have to say, right. and they were very important things in my life. You know, the fact is, though, the, that uh, growing up in Brooklyn, I didn't have any friends. I didn't have a friend in the world, uh, or in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I finally did make a friend. I finally did make a friend. His name was Abby. I remember one one. Saturday, 
uh, he couldn't be found. He, he wasn't anywhere around. And uh, I was determined I, I, I had to find him. You know? And so I found him. And I found that he was, he was uh, babysitting. And so that Saturday night, I went to, went there, and I, you know, I, I walked in and it was filled with records, but there were records all over the place, and uh, you know, it's playing, and I'm kind of listening to what's going on, and I'm hearing all kinds of things that were very strange coming out of a phonograph record. What I'm hearing is. What is that I see yonder coming, coming, coming? What is that I see yonder coming, coming, coming? Get on board, get on board. It's that union train a coming, coming, coming. It's that union train a coming, coming. It's that union train a coming, coming. Get on board, get on board, get on board, get on board. What's that? <laughs> and then there's another record, and it's a song about Jim Crow. And there's another song uh, about, I don't know, something else, but you, know, you, but you get the idea, you know. Uh, yeah. Join that union. Join the thing. You know, if you want higher wages, let me tell you what to do. You got to talk to the workers in the shop with you. You got to feel that the and if you all get together, boys, it won't be long. You get higher wages. You get better, better conditions. You know, it's like these are on records. I don't know what's this all about. Okay. Built this kind of social awareness. One of my earliest memories, and I probably couldn't have been more than six or seven or eight, was hearing Herbert Hoover, ra ra ra, put him in the ash can, ha ha ha. <laughs> now this was the early thirties. And also at that time in, in New York City, in you know, New York, uh, I, I was becoming very conscious. Also in that time, you know, you, you couldn't help but but be conscious. You know, you had wars and you had uh, Hitler coming up and, and all kinds of things. And uh, you know, so it was very. And also, I remember on street corners you had all kinds of politicians. You know. Uh, it, was, it was a very exciting time, you know. I mean, all the bad guys are up there, and the good guys, and the, you know. It was, it was, uh, anyway, so at the time in, in New York, they had on the city council, they had all kinds of you know political people running for for office, and one line in all that. The Communist Party had a thing there. And I said to my father, Dad, who are you voting for in the, the election? I mean, did you vote for Peter Caccioni? I still remember Peter Caccioni, who was a wonderful, wonderful, but he, he was a communist. He ran on the communist ticket. And he said, uh, now, now, who are you, who you going to vote for? You know, he said, well, I thought about it very seriously, and I finally decided that even though it was very much against my class interests, even though it was against my class interests, I decided I had to vote for Peter Caccioli. He's clearly the better guy. Mm -hmm. It brings tears to my eyes when I. It was so moving to me, even then. So I want to move forward to um, your time in the Navy and the Coast Guard, because you're right out of high school, you're in well, the middle what, of World well, War II. What, what, what happened was that uh, I was, 
I was approaching being drafted, you know, at that time, being drafted into the army, and and uh, I thought, gee, you know, I think I may want to join the Coast Guard instead of joining the muddy army. <laughs> Especially also since my older brother uh, was in the Coast Guard already. And they threw me onto the ship, and before I, I got both feet onto the ship, the ship was off in the way. They were just sitting there waiting for me. They needed me. They needed a radio operator. And we were out for maybe, you know, for a half hour already. And, um, and then the, someone would come in and hand us some papers and say, what do you do with this? They go, oh, well, you ship this off, you send this off to Washington, right around. Then we give you weather reports, you know. The weather reports, you know, for the, these were civilian aerographers, uh, send, uh, sending off these, their readings. But being fresh out of, out of uh, school, one of the first things you learned when you're at sea, you don't, you don't open radios, you know, because there's ships around you that are all, all, all being torpedoed, and then you you can sit and you can hear them. Uh, so that was pretty terrifying when you realize that this is what you were going to be doing. What what they told you though was that it was really the safest place you could be because this, the, 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 the U-boats, they needed the information just as well, just as much. Yeah, they were listening to everything, but that's what they needed. So it was a perfectly safe place to be. Uh, and we were on our way down to Trinidad, which was going to be the first stop. And after Trinidad, we were going further south to Recife, and to Recife, which was a port in Pernambuco, which is part. And we'd be met by a whole string of, you know, small, small boats, and by, <laughs> by not a very attractive <laughs> women, and all the way coming in, <laughs> They'd be there, and they'd be singing and whistling and thing, and you're like, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> we ever go ashore every night, you know, or every day, whatever, and you, we, we would go ashore, and and these girls would come up to us, and they'd throw their arms around you, and they'd rub themselves up against you, and say, it was like a, uh, a benediction almost. It was like, Jesus Christ, I love you like crazy, baby, no shit. <laughs> that, was <it. laughs> that was the benediction. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I love you like crazy, baby, no shit. <laughs> Very romantic. <laughs> yeah, very romantic. Isn't it romantic? Uh, then aboard ship, we'd be out for 30 days at a time. There was a, a little room there. It was like more like a closet. Now, there was a guitar in there. Or something, you couldn't really call it a guitar. It was just a, a keyboard. It had some strings on it, but, the, you know, the, you didn't know what the hell they were. And... And nobody aboard ship could help me with it. Um, so I took it one day and I went, uh, uh, this thing, I can't call it a guitar almost. And I went, and that's what it sounded like. <laughs> and so I took one note, I took ba 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 ba. And then I had another audio, which was terrible, but I tuned it until it sounded like something, mm -hmm. you know, something uh, that you could listen to. <laughs> and then I found another one and another. Now I had four strings that were 
related to each other. Now I begin to sing. And so I, you know, I the chord. had to do something else. Right, right, right. And I had to find a different chord to go with where. And then I found not only that, with those f four notes and, and that one chord, I could play a, a hundred songs that I know of. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, when I went, okay, when I got back from the war, and I went back to Brooklyn College, and uh, there were a lot of, uh, of you know, of left wing or liberal or, or con conscious uh, people. And then after a while, they'd say, hey, listen, we're having this meeting. Yeah, well, why don't you come and sing us a song or two? So I knew a song or two. So I, you know, and uh, that's where I first began performing. And it was a very artistic community, as it were. And that was called People's Songs. And that is all about Leonard Bernstein. And well, it wasn't Leonard Bernstein. Right. But it was Leonard Bernstein. You know? uh, and all kinds of people, you know, and, and Paul Robeson. And, and, and uh, there was a guy by the name of Lee Hayes. He was a writer, a singer, sort of. An organizer, and at any rate, he became head of People's Songs. And one day, I, I got a postcard from him. I didn't know it. Anyway, the postcard said, "Dear Fred, uh, uh, I, I hear that uh, you know, that you're a good singer, and uh, you know, why don't you come around and let's get acquainted?" And that's how I met Lee Hayes. And then from Lee Hayes. Hayes, that's how I met Pete Seeger. Because uh, Pete was very active with uh, people's songs. And then there was, while I was at Brooklyn College, I remember I got a job and uh, Ronnie Gilbert was a gal who got a job up there working in the office, but a wonderful singer. So there was Lee, and there was Pete, and now there was Ronnie and Fred. Because mm -hmm. we were always saying, well, we have to get a name for this, you know, because that's what we're coming up with crazy names constantly. Now, here I was at Brooklyn College, and at the time I was taking, I was an English major there. And I was taking a course in German drama. We were assigned uh, to read a play by Gerhard Hauptmann, who had just won a Nobel Prize for a play of his called The Weavers. And in The Weavers uh, it was, it was this play in which there were these weavers who were on strike and marching from one town to another singing marching songs you know to you know etc you know militant songs and the next day the, the weavers were, were getting together you know for your weekly rehearsal and I walked in there with a big smile and I said I think I have a name for us Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, what, 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 what? And he said, how about the weavers? Ah! <laughs> and that's where we got the name. But about that time, you know, is when the weavers were appearing all over the place and we were doing interviews and, and the first question, any interview was, where did you get the name the weavers? 
And before I had a chance to open my mouth, Pete said, oh, well, I, yeah, I read this play by Gerhard Hauptmann. Did you get that from Pete? <laughs> and then the next thing that happened was, uh, uh, you know, they, they said, oh, but where, did, where did you guys get the name the Weavers? And Lee Hayes says, uh, uh, oh well, uh, you know, I got that, got that from a gift out of I said, ah, that's not the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> and I've never said anything about that. Yes, just just they, before that. We were struggling. I remember walking in, into a rehearsal that we were having, because we did rehearsals. Rehearsal because we, we so enjoyed singing with each other. And that's when came up with the idea of, yeah, let's try to see if we can get a job out of Max Gordon at Village Vanguard. You know, first we did the audition, and then we thought, yeah, oh yeah, it's kind of nice. Yeah, we we'll come in for, for a month, uh, or for a month, yeah, for four weeks, four weeks. And we'll give you, uh, uh, we'll give you $200 for the week, $200 for the whole group. Fifty dollars a week we were working mm -hmm. there, and uh, I ordered a hamburger. <laughs> and uh, then Max came in one day when Pete was making a hamburger. <laughs> no more hamburgers. <laughs> and and then what happened was. Man, Right across the street was uh, uh, White Castle. They were nickel, <laughs> and so we, <laughs> we came over there, and we, we had paper bags that we <laughs> ripped it very loudly. <laughs> and he said, "What what is that?" He, he said, "Max, we can't afford your prices for this thing. Let them have the hamburgers." <laughs> so while we were down there. Gordon Jenkins was a big band leader. Anyway, he came down to Village Vanguard one night and he just fell in love with us. And he, he was, every night he was down there and if he didn't show up there, we figured he, oh, he must be sick. And he said, you know, I've got to record this group. If I have to pay for it myself, you know, I have to record this group. Um, and, you know, and he remained a very, very good friend. And, and so now you're going, all of a sudden, you are oh, where? stars. We're huge stars, huge stars. Then, you know, good night Irene came through along with Barbara and they were tired of listening to this and then. And, uh, and then when we finished that session, Never run across this before. When the, the orchestra just got up, and up and, which was oh boy. Okay, so now you're a big star. So emotionally, psychologically, what does it feel like to be on well, top of the world musically? Well, it felt very good. Uh, I felt very good in, in many ways. Uh, it allowed me to do some experimenting. When I was a I young man and never came up with I got to thinking it was quite remarkable. What I had missed. And I got me a girl. I will Is modestly say pretty wonderful some of some of the stuff I've come up with. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to talk about Joseph McCarthy. Well, that was really like an atomic bomb, that is. That blackness just shot, just exploded as a form. That no place would hire us for, no, for a club, no, no for a place they wanted to do concerts and this and that. And every concert was being picketed, uh, you know, and so on. Um, and uh, at the same time, 
I mean, I'd, I'd be waking up every morning and say, well, what am I going to do today? So I decided, damn it, you know, here I've been making a very nice living as a musician. And uh, I don't know a damn thing about music. And at the same time, um, I was madly in love with someone. I had this workshop where I was making arrangements and they were good arrangements. Good vocal arrangements. And uh, the singers loved what I was doing because it was fresh and it was new and it was, you know. And, and here, I, here I was in love. And never mind that I was broke. <laughs> I mean, I was now, well, I mean, I wasn't broke then, but, but you know, I had no future. <laughs> I had no future. And so on. It was, it was a terrible, terrible time. And yet it was the happiest time of my life. What drew me to Weston was this. It was around the Alice Delamar, mm -hmm. uh, which an Alice you know like to have interesting people surrounding her, and uh, these friends of mine were interesting people, <laughs> and they they were friends of Will Gear, who was a very good friend of mine also, and uh, uh, Will got blacklisted and, and you know from Hollywood. And uh, he was staying in a loft down on 27th Street. And, and he put on shows, and he and I would be putting on plays together. Uh, anybody, you know, would come in, walk in, walk, and Woody Guthrie would come by, and this one, and all kinds of people. Anyway, uh, the, these people who were in this loft, uh, also, you know, would say to me, hey, Fred, listen, you've got to come up to, to uh, uh, Newtown Turnpike, as it were, uh, you know, for the weekend. And I would come up and all kinds of people would be here. Lotta for example, you know, we up here half the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and a uh, movie star or something or... Or, or, or a writer, or, it was always, it was always, always, always interesting. And so anyway, so I would come up here, and I, I, I remember I would take a walk down Newtown Turnpike, which wasn't paved, by the way, at the time. Mm -hmm. But um, I was always so touched by saying, "My God, this is only an hour away from New York, or from Greenwich Village, where I live." Uh, but that's how I happened to, to, to know this area, you know, to first come up to this area and fall in love with it. I did stop at a real estate office up here, and I said, look, I'm looking for, you know, a small house, and, blah, 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 blah. and uh, I got a call from the real estate person. I said, I think we have a house for you. I said, oh, good, you know, because I'm, I'm coming up here for uh, next Sunday for, to, fine, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's how I came up here, and I, I booked this house, blah, 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 and I bought it. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, right away I moved in here. And uh, then we had a baby, Susan and I. Uh, well, once we were living here, it, it, was the, it was the time when they had Memorial Day you know, weekends and so on. And so you go down from the road downtown and, and people marching and so on. And towards the end of it, it was a parade of, of people saying, uh, you know, we're marching for peace and we don't like any of this peace from, from the, the war in Vietnam. And, uh, uh, it, was, it was it was so nice to be marching in a parade and not to be hearing Dad wanted to go back to Red Russia, uh, <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was, it was we felt so comfortable. We said, "Yeah, we're in the right place," uh, and uh, it, it really put a, a good <laughs> a good mark on on this area. So in. 
in the summer of 1970, uh, you two were married right here mm -hmm. on this property. From here, yeah, from this, this Under house. Under the tree. Um, <clears throat> the uh, New York Times did a very interesting description and of your in, wedding. And in Newsweek it was written up because we were the first to, we were the vanguard of the new Charlotte Curtis New York Times social page. She decided <laughs> to jazz it up. So um, tell us a little bit about Weston in that time. Um, for example, Town Center uh, was a little different than right, it is today. Talking to you, uh, when this all came up, I remembered. I don't. I don't remember the market at all from those days. Mm -hmm. But I remember that on the corner, maybe where the bank is now, there was a beauty parlor, and there was a drugstore. Who was running it at that time? I can't remember. But there, the drugstore had a soda fountain, <laughs> and that behind the fountain was Ethel Keen. I think okay. Keen Park over on the river is Keen named Park. after her. Okay. Oh. It was okay. named after her. Did your kids go to the Weston schools? Yes, yes, they did go to the Weston schools until ninth grade. And then we decided, Fred and I felt that there was a bigger world out there that, that when you become a teenager in Weston, you're pretty limited. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided to, they should go to Andover, they, which made them quite miserable. Because, of course, at the age of 12 or so, they have a lot of friends and attachments, and mm -hmm. we had to battle them. Mm -hmm. I One of the things I remember about the school is running a carpool. This was, I think, for either for the nursery school or the, the elementary. I drove a Volkswagen Beetle. Mm -hmm. I had four or five children <laughs> packed into it. I smoked. <laughs> there was no such thing as seatbelt. <laughs> That's like the beauty parlor. Because <laughs> yeah, the schools here were just absolutely wonderful. Really there was wonderful a wonderful school. math teacher in elementary for Simeon called Diane Besh, who mm -hmm. took him, gave him special attention, and the greatest of all the teachers, I think, was Doris Fiatakis. Ah, oh, well, mm, she, Doris. she's so special. Um, yeah. she, so well, recall. Simeon was involved in drama, and she had a spe she had all kinds of special programs for for certain kids, and she took care of the kids that would ordinarily have been bullied, maybe, and and uh, yeah. and she was just amazing. And there was so I built a recording studio here, and uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, would people come up from New York City? Oh yeah, to people record? would come up from New York City. They would, and this is where I worked with them as as well. And um, yeah, I did a lot of recording here. I remember, mm -hmm. you did one with Pete. Oh, I did several, a couple of things with with Pete at Seeger least, and least a bunch right. of other people as well. It Separate. started in the bedroom, which it became a child's bedroom, but it mm -hmm. started in a tiny room in the back. <laughs> And Fred kept buying more and more equipment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like yeah that, that's the place where I wrote music. I, you know, I, I, I it was... That it was, became his home. That, yeah, that mm -hmm. was my... In there all the time. My musical home. Anything I ever learned from myself about music, I learned in there. Mm -hmm. And I you know, wrote some very important uh, music in there. And there's, uh, how about, there's a mention of a theater workshop? Uh, it, it involved a lot of people in, in, in the Weston who, who were in the arts. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, well, Keir DeLay was living here, and, you know, Keir was a good friend. Yeah, uh, Hale was started, of course, and, you know, her husband, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I was very, very close to, to Helen, Helen, and I'd written a couple of shows with her. Uh, and uh, she, she was a wonderful, wonderful character. Uh, had a wonderful actress and, mm -hmm. and a wonderful everything. It was, it was a wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, it's a place where you could go and you could fail. You could do things that you wouldn't have a chance to do anywhere else. And I mean, for, for example, at the beginning, there were a few celebrities some people from Hollywood, you know, who were living in the area, you know, who, who, and at the very beginning we would begin to get some some newspaper people, you know, who want to do it, in, interviews, and, you know, and, and the other was, out, <laughs> out, that's not what it's for, it's not for, you know, for, it's, it's our private thing to do, 
and it's not we're not looking for publicity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's talk about um, I'm with you. your main social activities in Weston, in particular some of the interesting people that you knew in Weston at the time, some of which you've talked about previously. My my ba most basic you know things were from uh, to Sandy Jackson and and Gene Watts. Mm -hmm. uh, Gene Watts, you know, the brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, painter, painter who uh, had that fantastic, you know, uh, uh, you know, figure there. Mm -hmm. uh, As I understand it, there were kind of tenants on the general Delamar property, right? Yeah, but she wasn't paying for it. No, uh, but uh, Sandy was—he he's the one that kept uh, the the stream. All stocked with uh, trout, mm -hmm. you know. That, that's the thing that he had to do for Alice, and, and uh, that's so that you know. Came time. What do we have for dinner? Oh, let's have some uh, trout today. And, um, and Sandy and I would go out to to the stream, pick up some trout. Uh, Antonio Frescone. 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 That the woodcut. Of that woodcut of of. Woody. Woody Guthrie mm -hmm. is his. He was a famous woodcut uh, artist. That, well, that's woodcut. Also left wow. wing. Nice. Yeah, left wing. Good. Uh, yeah, well, he, <laughs> There's he, a theme. Enthusiastic. He, so here's a name for you, Fred Brooks. Uh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Fred Brooks was for a long time when I was, I was blacklisted. And if I wanted anything done, I would use a different name. So that's, I use a different name. <laughs> As a matter of fact, yeah, there's a little, uh, thing. I, I, I had done a lot of work with Belafonte. I was, Belafonte was an old friend of mine. And I worked for him a lot. And I record, wrote and recorded a lot of songs and arranged a lot of things for him. So, you know, I would go up to Harry's office. You know, if I had some new songs, I'd go up and, you know, I was, I was talking to Harry. And the door opens, and, and some some guy walks in. He comes in, and he said, "Hey, Harry, you know, while well, I've been here, I've been going through a bunch of files, you know, like you, you said, you know, we should go. I went through a bunch of files, and I came across a whole bunch of files here, with with a, 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 another conductor. I found some a lot of good scores here, but a good conductor of some some guy by the name of Fred Brooks." <laughs> 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 and so Harold straightened him out and said, this, this is Fred Hellerman. <laughs> wow! Uh, Woody Guthrie. You have uh, well, Woody, Woody, of course, I knew him very well. Well, half the time he spent through at, at, at uh, Pete Seeger's house on you know, Bleecker Street. Mm. You have talked about visiting him in the hospital with Harold. That was sort of an interesting uh, yeah, story. Yeah, that came. Oh, yeah, that, you know, that, that was very, and you know, we were very close to, to Woody. Very significant guy. Uh, wasn't well known. Yeah. Well, at any rate, at, somehow he ended up in New Jersey, uh, in a mental hospital mental in, in New Jersey. And as far as I knew, Harold and I were the only ones who knew where he was. We came in to, to, uh, to, to visit uh, Woody Guthrie. Now, I don't know if you remember uh, a character in a movie, Hollywood movie, because he was in there all the time. He was always... William, the, 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 the character, and always the de German character. He knows everything. Yeah, so we, and that's who we got. We got to see. The <laughs> doctor? And, and we got to see the doctor, and he goes to the file. He says, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Woody Guthrie. Uh, 
Yeah, he's a sick man. Well, what's, what's the matter with him? <laughs> delusions, he's got delusions. <laughs> he says he, he writes hundreds of songs. <laughs> he says he writes all... <laughs> <laughs> he can't write, can't write any songs, he does that. And, and, oh yeah, hey, he's got the most songs here. <laughs> yeah, he's sick man, yeah, he's sick man. <laughs> I would say, well, uh, he, he says that he wrote a thousand songs. I would, well, yes, he has. <laughs> but he doesn't hear me, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's sick man. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, Arlo. Oh, well, Arlo, he, he would come up to our office and he'd be singing all day, because where else did he have to go? You know? Arlo was going to tell that story about the Alice, you know, the, the Alice's restaurant and this and that. Everything. Well, now, that spread over WBAI. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. You know, constantly, 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 constantly. It was clearly... Is that the song we're an easy thing <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to get recorded, you know. And I, I, you know, I produced it. The song's called Alice's and Restaurant. And so I, I, uh, I said, okay, look, we'll go in there and we'll record that. We'll get a bunch of people in there. So I made the mistake of of, of getting all of his friends in to this thing, you know, to do it. And we recorded and. You can get anything you want at Alice's restaurant. It wasn't quite as good. You can get anything and you I want. That is the mistake I made. Because I sang this thing for a whole audience that had heard it a million times already. <laughs> they were yawning. <laughs> I mean, no, they weren't yawning, but something like it did, didn't have to. Right. Didn't have the it's energy, you know, you know, so I got rid of them, and, and I just got a whole bunch of people who hadn't heard it. And then, but still, you know, it, it, it came out better than it was the first time, but it didn't come out quite as, you know, the record, mm -hmm. quite as, and so I spent a month, because, you know, I, I had a lot of, Tapes. So I spent a month putting in all the laughs. No one, no one, no one ever, ever, ever said that any of those laughs were. <laughs> they didn't realize. <laughs> um, how about uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary? Beautiful. Well, they, you know, they, they really talk of themselves as the children of the weavers, and it's, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> well, last uh, personality would be the obvious one, Pete Seeger. Oh yeah, yeah. No, he's, he's, there's no one comes close to, you know, to what he's done. Uh, I mean, I've had I've had big arguments with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've had big arguments with him, for example, where, there, there were, I remember there was one point where kids were coming up to him and, you know, he wants this, he wants that, they want this, they want that, and he, he, he got into some kind of kick where he's saying, well, forget about whatever you know, anything you ever know about it, forget about it, just go and do it, you know? And you know, and he went through a whole thing. Don't go, don't go studying don't any of that stuff. Don't <laughs> learn that any of that. And I said, Peter, how, how can you say that? <laughs> how can you tell kids to take books and and to burn them? <laughs> you know, and, and really, we used to get the big arguments about that because he was. I mean, he, this was the thing he was into right now. <laughs> uh, last couple of questions. Uh, do you listen to music today? No. Okay. Why is that? I find it is so anti-music. It's such crap. Um, 
any other thoughts you'd like to share? Any uh, thoughts of your legacy or any other Thank profound you. thoughts that you might have? Do you have a profound thought? I don't have a profound thought. Okay. <laughs> Let me look on the page. <laughs>